ourselves to fit the world and by the world are shaped again. The visible and the invisible working together in common cause to produce the miraculous. The miraculous. I'm thinking of the way how the intangible air when past its speed round a shaped wing easily holds our weight. So may we in this lifetime Trust to those elements that we have yet to see or imagine and find the true shape of our own self by forming it well to the great intangibles about us. Working together by David White. David wrote that poem as a, um, a commissioned project for the Boeing companies back in the 90s for the launch of the 777. To this day, the 777 um, is and remains the most successful launch ever in the history of Boeing um, on either side of, um, of that particular poem. And when he wrote the poem, he was trying to capture the quality of flight and the magic of flight where you have multiple forces operating, working together, the thrust, lift, gravity. Um, and drag and producing something that we all find particularly miraculous, the movement of a plane from the ground up, lifted by things that we can't see. He also wrote it as an homage to the human beings, thousands and thousands of human beings working in countless places across the globe, producing every single part that got pulled together, creating this thing called the 777 that makes it possible for all of us to fly from place to place. When I think about that poem, I also think about the starlings and the murmurations. I think about the movement, how, when it's, especially when it's set to music, um, how it seems like a choreographed dance. It's magical. And yet, do you know that there's no choreographer? That's obvious because it's starlings. There's no choreographer. There's just individual starlings working in concert, producing something miraculous. Every starling, every starling, pays attention, as far as we can tell, from modeling and studying. Every starling is paying attention to seven other starlings in its closest vicinity. And every one of those is paying attention to seven others. And you see that seven times seven times seven turns into something miraculous. Each starling, shaped by the movement of seven around, each seven shaped by the movement of a starling. The profound treasure of love. Where starlings are paying attention, you can intend to love. Where starlings are programmed to move and adjust, you can choose. You can choose to love. Scott Peck said in his seminal um, work, The Road Less Traveled, just by show of quick hands, how many of you read The Road Less Traveled ever? It was, for me, a seminal book, the most profound um, book that, that I read early in my uh, journey to uh, be standing here in front of you. Um, and in particular, the chapter on love. Um, and he talks about love, and he says, you know, love has kind of been tried to define by many philosophers, theologians, average human beings, um, romantics, etc. And um, if, it's, if I'm Scott Peck, I'm not going to try to tell you what it is as a formal definition. I'm going to try to tell you how I think about it. And it landed with me back in 1989 when I first read that book. And it feels present and palpable in, in me today, right now, as I stand in front of you. And as I think about starlings murmuring, and I think about the murmuring in our community, and I think about all that can ripple out from this. He said that this this, that love, love is the willingness, the will, right? The decision, the willingness, the will, the decision to extend oneself, to extend myself for my own and your personal spiritual development, to care, to attend to the treasure of love. 
each starling paying attention to seven other starlings, what would it be like? How would we shape each other? How would we shape the world if we allowed the world to love us and shape us? And how would we shape the world if we chose? If you chose right now, if you made the conscious choice to use your life, the precious inheritance that you came into this life with, if you used your life to love seven human beings around you deeply, intentionally, openly, and what they might do with that. There are a handful of dimensions that we could talk about to even consider any of those things. I think I want to um, talk about two of them today. I want to try to give you a little bit of an exercise. I'm probably we're a little ahead of time. I may borrow a couple of minutes from what amounted to a buffer uh, to, uh, to give back to you. I am... Um, um, you, um, you saw Vidya up here yesterday. Vid and I worked together, um, and we have for quite a few years, um, uh, lovingly in support of and in an attempt to try to um, bring up and um, support all of you through the work that we do in the Advanced Academy. Um, one more quick show of hands. How many of you are scouts in the room? Just take a look around. Make note of scouts. Scouts are human beings that have been through our advanced program that do work on these sort of deep questions in an attempt to put this out more fully into the world through their one wild and precious life. Um, Bid may say a few things about that before we're done here. But know that what you're doing here and what we're doing now is in some sense part of the much deeper exploration that's possible when you're ready. But you don't need to do anything other than decide to love, just to be clear. That's really the only price to admission for the long game is the decision to love. So a couple of dimensions. Um, let's start with the test. Um, this is not the Mensa test, for those of you that remember the trauma of the ILP, just to be clear. Um, but this is a test. This is a test of time, a relationship to time, three circles. You all have books. Open the book up to the area where you've got a blank page. You can, it can be next to my name. It doesn't really matter. But uh, an area where you've got the blank page. Now, I'm going to give you some instructions, so please listen before you do what comes next. And I'm going to ask you to do something, and then I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes to have a conversation with the person closest to you or at your table, um, and then I will ring the bell. I'll go grab the bell while you're doing the exercise. I'll ring the bell and bring us back. Um, but I want to give you a direct experience of something. So here's the exercise. It's no more complicated than this, so don't overthink it. I'm going to ask you to draw three circles. Does everybody know how to draw a circle? Right, okay. So you've got 90% of the exercise already down in your bones. You just draw a circle. They don't have to be perfect circles. They can be roughly circular or linear, right? So just rough circles. I'm going to ask you to draw a circle that represents the past. I'm going to ask you to, don't start drawing yet, you eager beavers. This is not an achievement contest. Ask you to draw a circle that represents the past. I'm going to ask you to draw a circle that represents the present. And I'm going to ask you to draw a circle that represents the future. You can draw them any size, in any orientation, up, down, left, right, horizontal, vertical. They can overlap anywhere on the page. It doesn't actually matter. Three circles, past, present, and future. I'll give you 30 seconds. Go. Great. If there are an even number of folks at the table, this is going to be super simple. Just turn to the person closest to you. If there is an odd number, there are going to be three of you. Just compare and contrast circles. Spend two minutes talking about your circles and why you drew them the way that you drew them. Go. All right. Now, in case you're wondering what you just did, this is a, a it's, it's one of many ways that um, cultural researchers over the years, starting with a guy named Gert Hofstede, who I had the great uh, fortune of working with back in the um, early 90s um, in Europe, 
they use to um, get a sense of what makes one culture different from another culture. Um, uh, orientation to time and how time flows or doesn't flow between past, present, and future. Um, I'm assuming that you had some differences at your table. Would that be an accurate assumption? It's fascinating, right? I mean, it's a simple thing of writing in circles, past, present, and future, and yet I would bet that you have some things that look, uh, you know, maybe some sizes that look like this. Now, these are, broadly speaking, these are cultural aggregates. So if you aggregate way up from this room, and, and most of you would be Americans, um, you'd see that for the most part, Americans in general, not universally, in general, have a slightly smaller version of the past than, say, um, the UK. That's not so surprising, given that the US has a relatively short history relative to Europe. Um, and you can see just in a few other countries, France, Spain, and Germany, that you get some different sizes and slightly different shapes. Um, if you go to the present, you can see that our present, on average, in aggregate, on average, is disconnected from the past. Also, not all that surprising because history for us is still relatively short and we don't necessarily feel a need to honor deep long-term history. If you look at Spain, though, um, you get a massive circle for the present. And then if you look at the future, more often than not, as Americans, we look to what comes next, and it's about how much can we achieve and how much can we do. You would not be here in this room today with us engaged in this multidimensional exploration of what it means to be you if you didn't do this well already. But look how different that is from Spain. Spain is this tiny little dot for the future. If you've ever been to Spain, and in some sense this is also in Mexico, the term manana, 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 man, it's all, it'll wait, it's okay, it'll wait. Like right now, let's grab the day, let's enjoy it while it's here. Uh, this orientation plays out. If you look more broadly, I'll show you a, maybe a big mashup of this. More broadly, you can see that there are quite a few differences across the globe. Again, in aggregate, these are different. You might find something up here that sort of represents yourself. If you do, wonderful. You might have something that's completely and utterly unique for you. That's also wonderful. Here's what I bet you didn't know before you just did this exercise if you've never done it before. Is you didn't know that you had an orientation to time and that that orientation to time affects what you can think and do. On the truck, on the opposite side of my page, the range of what we think and do is limited by what we fail to notice. If you don't notice that you have an orientation to time that you came into this conversation with, you have no way of relating to it except through habit. That makes sense? Right? The range of what you think and do is limited by what you fail to notice, and because you fail to notice that you fail to notice, there's little you can do to change. Step one is just recognizing your orientation of time. We talked about it um, uh, last time in 19 when we had this program, the, the long arc of time. Rand walked you through the various um, iterations of that. Um, I want to do maybe for the next couple of minutes is try to bring you into full presence with that and to give you a choice, a longer choice, a choice to extend yourself for the sake of those seven human beings around you that you can love openly, honestly, and deeply. The treasure of love and being loved. Dimensions of time, this is now present, like most of us live in today and tomorrow and, and to here. You know, we're carrying some vestige of what happened yesterday. If it was a good thing, like the wonderfulness that we came into this room feeling reasonably good, upbeat, probably a little bit more open-hearted than when we entered yesterday. We might be thinking about already some things that we have to do this afternoon or tomorrow as, as we move on. I know that that occurs to me. This is now for us. This is now for all of us. But now exists in this longer thing that from the Long Now Foundation, they call nowadays, and it's kind of decades. We call it decading, right? You think about the past 10 years, you think about this current 10-year frame that you're in um, and what might be possible, and maybe you're planning um, the additional 10 years in the future, and you are wonderful. The art of decading, long-term locating yourself in that. But notice in this decading, in this nowadays, now exists inside of nowadays. If you back way up, and this is what we tried to do last time, is to invite you into a much broader, deeper, longer consideration. The Long Now Foundation was put in place, um, started specifically, specifically to consider the long, long term, to play the long, long game. Not an infinite game for us because we can't necessarily do that, but we can play a long, long game. 
But notice that in the long now, the nowadays, the three decades, fit inside of that easily. And notice that now, today, yesterday, and tomorrow fit inside the decades easily. Here's the subtle turn that's not so obvious. The 10,000, 10,000 years on either side of now is also present with us. You inherited so much. Your birthright, when you came into this life, you inherited so much from your ancestors, from our ancestors, from the universe, from God. All of that's present right now, and yet it's part of this multi-10,000 year, million years of evolution, of journey, of this place. And everything that we do today is already influencing 10,000 plus years from now. That's a really hard, abstract thing to wrap your head around. So we just make it a little bit easier for you, and we call it decading. We ask you to come back. We ask you to think about and care about and find and source, truly source what you're here to do. As Mary Oliver said, you know, what is it you intend to do with your one wild and precious life? So, locating yourself in a long arc of time right now, but not forgetting that you are part of a long, long journey in time. This is an orientation. And I would suggest to you that in addition to the seven people that you can love fully, you can love this concept of time itself. That you can love this life so much that you put things into this lifetime that you will never see. The society that plants trees in the shades of which they will never sit. That's that orientation. So let's take those ideas and time and see if we can play with it just a little bit and maybe tie it to uh, the, the artifacts that are sitting on the table. The idea of the inside and the outside, that maybe a strip. Right? If this is time as it is right now, three discrete circles that may overlap and may interrelate with each other. This is time reimagined, reframed, where past is always present in now. The future is always present and influencing now. The now, the present, can influence the past. Just a reframe of what happened yesterday makes yesterday different. Just rethinking or thinking differently about tomorrow makes tomorrow different. They are not three discrete circles. They're a double twisted Mobius strip. They're related. They're always in conversation with each other. David White talks about this idea of the conversational nature of reality. We're always, our life is always in conversation with life, and life is always talking with us. We are shaping our environment, and our environment is shaping us. We are shaping our loved ones, our loved ones are shaping us. And if you can onboard that as an idea, mm -hmm. and hold open-heartedly, with open hands, this idea of shaping the future, the long now future, if you can shape the future with love, what does that do? How does that bend the curve on where we are today? How does it change the trajectory that we seem to be embroiled in? It's a radical, radical reconfiguration of love and care and orientation. What would it take for you to do that? Two most important days of your life. The day that you were born the day that you inherited the treasures in this lifetime, the treasure of love, the treasure of all that was built in advance of us. We stepped into, in, a, in the U.S. especially, but into the world in general, we stepped into a world that was improving. Just think about the conversation that Mike had with us yesterday. We stepped into a world where we didn't have to create most of what we have. We stepped into a world that we didn't necessarily deserve other than to have been loved into existence. We stepped into a world where we had the chance to express what's wildly ours. If you've been to any of these before, you've heard me say something like what I'll say next. Your life, however you think and feel about it right now, is profoundly, utterly unique. In all of existence, there's only you. Life is trying to do something through love with you. You know that you're there when you find the source of your purpose. And I don't mean some placard you put on the wall. 
I mean the energy that arises in you when there's nothing left to give. So the second most important day of your life is the day that you discover and understand why you were born. This image up here is an image of a a Japanese philosophical stance. Uh, Nishitani-san is in the audience here, so he may feel free to correct me on a a break, but it's an orienting frame for me. Um, Ikigai. Um, And in, in some sense, it's just a blending of what you love, what the world needs, what you could get paid for or receive from, and what you're good at. And if you start mashing those things up and putting them together, What you end up with is a life potentially well-lived. It's a life lived on purpose. The day that you were born and the day that you find out why. And that's from Mark Twain. I'm going to end with a poem that I'm uncharacteristically going to read for you here in just a minute. I want to set it up with a couple of things um, with a quick story. Realizing that I'm getting flashed up here because I'm borrowing now from the buffer. I hope you're okay with that, by the way. (laughs) Some years ago, one of our um, beloved coaches, Phil Gable, um, died. Um, uh, We called him Koso. He called himself Koso. Um, And um, Phil's wife, Paula, asked me to speak at a memorial service for him in Dallas. And um, I was was like great trepidation. I, I really wanted to honor Phil, and I didn't know what to say or, or how to say it. I, I, you know, I got a thousand thoughts. Phil and I had a lovely, warm, and also complicated relationship in the work that we do in the world. Um, and I had deep and profound respect and love for him. And I, I didn't quite know what to say. So I'm sitting on a plane. I'm flying back you know, from somewhere on the East Coast. And I'm sketching out some notes. And there was a gentleman sitting next to me. And um, he said, hey, it looks like you're working on something kind of important there. I'm like, like, man, I don't like to be talked to on a plane, dude. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, uh, I am. And he said, so uh, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, it's like not really a eulogy, but I'm trying to write something that I want to say, you know, about a friend. And he pulls out this piece of paper and he said, I don't know why I brought this with me today, (laughs) but I think it's for you. (laughs) Uh, He's like, you know, the visible and the invisible working together. I'm just saying, when love is present, you know, all is possible. I'm going to leave you with three words. I'm going to read the poem, and I'm going to come back to the three words or the three phrases. Momento more. Momento vivere. Carpe diem. Momento more. Remember, you will die. Momento vivere. Also know, you must live. Carpe diem, seize the day, seize this day. We'll get this poem to you through materials and probably a follow-up. I'm going to show it up on the screen. It's an eye test for me. I'm going to read from here. It's still an eye test for me, so I'm going to read with some glasses. All right. It's called What Will Matter? And the gentleman that gave this to me studied with Michael Josephson. I invite you just to sit back and listen. Close your eyes if you like, but just take this in and notice what comes up. You'll get a chance to capture a few notes. Ready or not, ready or not, someday this will all come to an end. There will be no more sunrises, no minutes or hours or days. All the things you collected, whether treasured or forgotten, will pass on to someone else. Your wealth, your fame, your temporal power will shrivel to irrelevance. It will not matter what you owned or what you were owed. Your grudges, resentments, frustrations, and jealousies will finally disappear. So too will your hopes and your ambitions, your plans and all of your to-do lists, they'll expire. The wins and losses that once seemed so important will fade away. It won't matter where you came from or from what side of the tracks you lived on at the end of your life. It won't matter whether you were beautiful or brilliant, or both for some of you, even your gender and skin color, even your gender and skin color will be irrelevant. So what will matter? How, how will you value or the value of your days be measured? What will matter is not what you bought, but what you built, not what you got, but what you gave, love in parentheses, what you gave, not what you bought, but what you built, Not what you got, but what you gave. What will matter is not your success, 
but your significance. What will matter is not what you learned, but what you taught. What will matter is every act of integrity, compassion, courage, and sacrifice that enriched and empowered the lives of others and encouraged them to emulate your example. What will matter is not your competence, but your character. What will matter is not how many people you knew, but how many people will feel the lasting, the lasting loss of you and your life when you're gone. Thank you, Phil. What will matter are not your memories, but the memories of you that live on and your loved ones. What will matter is how long, not how long you'll be remembered, but by whom and for what. Living a life of matter doesn't happen by accident. It's not a matter of circumstance. It's a matter of deep and profound choice. Choose a life that matters. Choose a life of love. Choose to love the long game of this life. Choose to love each other. Momento mori. Momento vivere. Carpe diem. Thank you.